Okay, good evening everybody. Uh, my name is Daniel Scheck. I'm a member of the board of the Arava Institute for Environmental Studies. Um, welcome to you and welcome to uh, the people who are connected and viewing us uh, online. Uh, welcome to the event which is entitled Applied Environmental Diplomacy Pathways to Sustainability in the Jordan River Basin. Uh, this event uh, is in the framework of a series of yearly events that we uh, hold in the memory uh, of uh, the late Noam Siegel, um, who was a great collaborator and friend of the Institute. And we will uh, kick off uh, with a few words from two people who uh, uh, will uh, speak uh, about Noam, and we will start with uh, his father, Dr. Peret Siegel. Please. Honorable scholars from the Arava Institute and the Oxford Martin School. Did you hear my first opening? Okay, so I'll start again. Honorable scholars from the Arava Institute and the Oxford Martin School, Oxford University, practitioners from Israel, Jordan, and Palestine, ladies and gentlemen. We were very touched that you dedicated the event in memory of our beloved son, Noam. Especially, we thank you for continuing with his initiative to advance science-led environmental diplomacy. Noam invested so much efforts to establish it, but unfortunately passed just before it launched. Every day I look on Noam's photo beside my bed and think of what he lost. His love to his wife, children and family, and his friendship with colleagues. Furthermore, his loss of meaningful life full with desire to make a better world. In a memorial family am album on Noam that his wife Vered edited, there's a recipe for a perfect father <laughs> that his children wrote towards Father's Day in the year 218. I'll read some parts of it. One cup of coolness, one kilo storytelling, half a kilo of trips in nature, two kilo ice skating, three kilo biking, a daily bottle of orange juice, a bag of board games, 200 gram changing nippers, 500 gram of computer skill, 160 gra 160 grams preparing sushi, one kilo of joking, and infinite grams of love. But they conclude, don't try to prepare. There isn't another father like him. We wish you a delicate recipe for this far-reaching initiative by which Noam's memory will be blessed. Thank you. Um, the next uh, person to speak uh, a few words about uh, Noam is a former colleague of his who will join us uh, online, Dr. Javier Lazome, who is co-investigator in the Oxford Martin Program on Transboundary Resource Management Research Program, analyzing the potential for cross-border cooperation on natural resources in the Eastern Nile Basin and the Jordan Valley Basin. Uh, I hope uh, Javier is with us, and if you are, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Go ahead. Yeah, perfect. Um, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure. It's an honor to be with you today, even if it's only um, virtually. My name uh, is Javier Lezaun. I direct the Institute for Science, Innovation, and Society at the University of Oxford, um, which was Noam's academic home 
at Oxford. Um, I believe his plan to come to our institute originated in a meeting that Noam had with our late colleague, um, Steve Rayner. Um, I was not at that meeting, but I always thought that uh, Steve and Noam must have hit it off um, because Steve um, was not one to rush to embrace uh, new collaborators. And, and the fact that he had invited Noam to come to Oxford and join the Institute um, told me already that um, Noam was a very special intellectual and, and colleague. Uh, at the Institute, Noam worked on the ideas that would become the Oxford Martin program for transboundary resource management. And there were two things that struck me immediately about uh, Noam's outlook. One, of course, was his deep uh, commitment to sustainable energy futures and to environmental justice. But I was also struck, and I think this is probably what brought him and Steve together, um, I was struck by Noam's appreciation of the political power of science. And by the political power of science, I, I do not mean that science should be put at the service of political ideas, but rather than, um, I think he was convinced that science and scientific evidence um, was a powerful instrument to affect uh, political change, particularly in areas of entrenched political conflict uh, and that being able to use science for that purpose required a very precise understanding of institutional realities. I, I was recently rereading what I think is the first document or text that Noam uh, put together or at least circulated at the Institute in the fall of 2017. Uh, it's a document he called a, a blueprint for Jordan, Israel and Palestine in which he presents, and I quote, a, a vision for sustainable water and energy security based on transboundary cooperation, which recognizes and addresses the political conflict. Uh, and the most noticeable element in that document uh, is this uh, emphasis on finding politically viable solutions, solutions that will have traction under very challenging political circumstances, but will also help change those circumstances for the better. So I'm, I'm really pleased that um, Noam's ideas continue to be put into practice by the Araba Institute, by the Oxford Martin program and by their partners. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Javier. Thank you. So uh, this year's uh, uh, Noam Siegel event, uh, for this year's event, we are uh, taking advantage of the presence of a very distinguished group of uh, scientists from uh, Oxford who are currently uh, visiting Israel in the framework of uh, uh, this, uh, one of the leading projects of uh, uh, the Track to Environmental Forum. Um, and uh, they will present uh, some of their work uh, as they have done over the past few days uh, to Israeli officials, to Palestinian officials, and starting tomorrow to Jordanian officials. Um, through the evening, you will understand the rationale, uh, both of the, um, of the Track 2 Environmental Forum and of the specific input uh, that uh, this unique partnership with the uh, Oxford Martin School uh, has brought uh, to our projects and vision. Um, the Arava Institute uh, has in its DNA the notion of, uh, of regional cooperation long before it was such a buzzword as it is uh, today uh, across the region and uh, beyond the region. Um, but as we will hear later in the evening, uh, the Arava Institute was, is an academic institution and had it sort of the confines of its uh, campus. Uh, but in the past few years, we have uh, really, really grown uh, beyond that. And we are very proud of a number of projects on the ground that uh, bring the experience and know-how of uh, the Arava Institute together with Palestinian partners and Jordanian partners 
to the to the real uh, people to the societies uh, living uh, in the in this area and with time we have uh, we have discovered that we can use uh, environmental challenges as a way to bring together uh, across the borders uh, people who don't usually talk to each other and on the other hand uh, we can use diplomatic tools in order to uh, help resolve cross-boundary environmental challenges and more most importantly uh, those connected to uh, climate change so we have this long-term vision of developing what I sometimes call a new branch on a very old tree of diplomacy, which would be uh, envi uh, applied environmental diplomacy with a big, big A on the applied, as you will hear uh, during uh, the evening. Um, in order to uh, introduce uh, maybe the, the, the beginning of this, uh, of this discussion, we will uh, all look at a, watch a short video uh, about the Arava Institute, and then we will continue with our speakers. Because the environment can't wait for peace between Israelis and Palestinians, and the Arava Institute was founded in order to advance cross-border environmental cooperation in the face of political conflicts. The Arava Institute has research centers, cooperation initiatives, and an academic program. The Arava Institute is, uh, is unique because it's decided to deal with transboundary environmental issues in our region. The goal is to take the theory from the classroom about water, about partnerships, about uh, the shared environment, and to apply these uh, theories on the ground to improve people's lives and to build a different narrative. Here, the role of the Arava Institute is actually to build a consortium of researchers, of regional leaders, to bring them together and to plan the future action that will help us adapt and uh, mitigate uh, climate change in our region. When we look at the big picture, it's very hard to find a starting point. The Arava Institute provides a starting point where we can actually work together on tangible projects that change the situation of communities and the environment on the ground, and doing that through fostering trust. The, the work that the Arava Institute does in uh, climate change adaptation and uh, mitigation actually touches upon the uh, food security, the energy security, the water uh, security issues that are important for, uh, for our region and that they are important for the environmental uh, justice of uh, the region that we live in. Our academic program prepares future leaders, both from Israel, Palestine, Jordan and around the world, um, to really come together and to work on environmental issues and environmental challenges. We work also with, uh, with communities, communities in, uh, in Palestine, in, uh, in Jordan, in Gaza, in the, uh, in the Negev. I think the Arava Institute demonstrates a way where true collaboration can happen. Before I came here, I, uh, I had this uh, idea of what the people on the other side may think, what they may speak about, how they interact, and now I know that what I thought was completely different than what I realized today. I come here, I see something different. I see like the people who is like caring for us, it's like we're sharing everything together, and and now we are living together. Part of our program is bringing people together, not only to learn, but also to live together. We built the program in order to provide space for getting to know one another, for building trust, for having sometimes difficult conversations with the purpose of really creating long-lasting friendships and connection. It just widens your heart, you yeah. know? It's like uh, you just filled with love for the environment and for people and for culture and for language. The Institute's vision is to take all of this and turn it into a global center for applied environmental diplomacy that uses the environment to build peace in the region so that we can pass off to our children uh, a world which is more sustainable and more peaceful. We live together in this, uh, in this region and we have to work together to solve our region's environmental uh, problems. We don't have the luxury to, to give up.
So uh, the track to environmental forum is uh, um, the brainchild of a few people who uh, uh, a few years ago, five or six years ago, uh, got together in order to try and envision where uh, the Arava Institute should, uh, should be going in the future. Um, one of these people uh, is uh, David Lehrer, the same from the video, who at the time uh, was uh, uh, director of the Arava, executive director of the Arava Institute, uh, position he held for many, many years. So many of the programs of the, uh, of the Institute uh, uh, date back to the period where David was uh, in charge there. Uh, David, uh, uh, Dr. David Lehrer, uh, left us uh, roughly a year ago, a bit less, uh, to teach at uh, Boston University uh, and to rediscover his, uh, his uh, home country, the United States. He spent many weeks uh, traveling around the country. And he is freshly off the plane, practically uh, back here for uh, our event. Uh, David will uh, immediately um, uh, take on new responsibilities at the Institute. He will be uh, Director of International Development and among uh, many other tasks that uh, uh, he will be expected to help with. Uh, the Track to Environmental Forum will heavily rely on his uh, well-proven skills. So please, David, come and say a few words about the forum. Okay. Oh, is this? Okay. Does this work? Is this? Yeah. Okay. Um, so because we believe that uh, the environment can't wait for peace between Palestinians and Israelis and peoples in the region, and because we believe that by working together on common environmental uh, concerns like climate change, um, we build a more peaceful uh, relationship with our neighbors, the Arava Institute is dedicated to advancing cross-border environmental cooperation in, despite the political conflicts. Um, as Dani said, a few years ago, the Aravai Institute decided to take um, what we teach in the classroom and what we study through our research and try it out on the ground to create um, real proof of concept that cooperation, especially environmental co cooperation and natural resource cooperation, can have a positive impact on people in the region. Um, <coughs> So uh, we live in this kind of uh, 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 feedback loop of uh, natural resources which impact wars and conflict, which impact uh, uh, ecosystems, which then impact the availability of natural resources. And then if you add to that uh, population growth and climate change and, and an increase in consumption, you get this uh, um, increasing uh, feedback loop. Um, and these can have institutional impacts um, around our region, an example of a wastewater facility that overflowed in Gaza. Um, so uh, the Track 2 Environmental Forum, as Danny said, was, was founded uh, about five years ago, 2016, to promote environmental agreements between Jordan, Israel, and Palestine to improve lives, protect the environment, and, and uh, protect uh, our f and build uh, peaceful relations. Um, it's most important based on uh, trust. Uh, that's the key element to um, uh, cooperation. Uh, it's a partnership between Palestinian and Israeli NGO, uh, which is based on trust. We have direct relations with many of the community leaders that we work with. Um, and with them, with the community leaders, we try to analyze what are the problems that they face. We don't come from above and say this is uh, the solution, we say, what are the problems and how can we uh, help to support that? We came up with a kind of formula um, that we started with track two, but we, we feel like this has um, a real uh, um, um, lesson to learn about how to apply environmental diplomacy. 
Instead of looking at these mega projects, top-down infrastructure mega projects, we bring bottom-up solutions. Um, and the reason that these are effective is because, first of all, they're smaller. The initial investment is smaller, making them easier to get it to come in. Um, they're managed by the beneficiaries. They're modular, and they can be scaled up. Um, and they have long-term sustained operation because the beneficiaries are the ones that are running them, not uh, government. Um, on the other hand, government officials are important. We can't, we, national government officials are critical. We can't get equipment into Gaza without that. We can't get people to cross borders without government assistance. We can't get information, data, without government partnerships. And so um, uh, this Track 2 Environmental Forum is not only engaging local leaders and, and community leaders, but also uh, uh, reaching top down as well. Um, it, it's a multinational network, as you see here, people from Oxford University, people from Palestine, people from Jordan, from Israel, and, and now we're stretching out to, into countries in the MENA region. Um, and what's critical is that these are proof of concept, but the idea is to uh, develop something that can be scaled up and replicated so that you can actually solve real uh, national and, and uh, international problems. And as just a few quick examples of some of the stuff we've already done, remember we, we met in this forum about uh, two and a half years ago at the, or almost three years ago, I guess, at the, at the very start of the pandemic, um, era of pandemic, as we say. And, uh, and at that time, many, much of what I'm showing you now was really um, just in the pipeline, or we were thinking about it, or we were testing it. But today, we've already managed to get uh, a number of atmospheric water generators into Gaza with the cooperation of uh, government leaders and local community leaders providing clean water, uh, drinking water that is produced from the uh, um, atmosphere, uh, produced from the uh, humidity in the atmosphere. And this uh, um, and this is with the partnership with a, a for-profit company with WaterGen. Um, it, it has even managed to provide water to uh, um, Palestinians in Gaza a year ago during the uh, May uh, conflict when water supplies were cut and uh, in certain regions our WaterGen was the only source of clean drinking water. Um, another problem that many uh, face in the region is wastewater treatment and uh, a lack of wastewater treatment. And so in the past year, we've managed to introduce a modular wastewater treatment system into Abbasan al-Kabira, a small community in Gaza where a neighborhood is being serviced by this. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And here you can see that this uh, system was being put into place exactly during the war. And even though work on the system stopped in May, during the war, as soon as the war was over, everybody went back to work and the uh, system is now operational. Um, another problem that is faced in Gaza that we are working on now is the fact that uh, solar energy has become one of the main sources of electricity for a lot of people in the, those communities where the uh, electricity from the grid is no longer reliable. Uh, and therefore, um, people are putting uh, it's probably one of the fastest growing communities in the world where solar energy is being adopted, rooftop solar. And that comes with batteries. Batteries, because people want electricity at night, those batteries are often very cheap acid-based batteries which um, uh, end up having to be disposed of and there is no uh, um, toxic waste site. There's no hazardous waste site in Gaza, so those batteries get thrown into the, uh, the garbage dumps, into the Mediterranean Sea, into and poisoning the aquifers. And so we're working on solutions, again, to get those batteries out and to bring them to Israel's uh, um, hazardous waste site. And this would be a great example of environmental cooperation, cross-border environmental cooperation. Another project that we're very proud of is a large uh, waste, treated wastewater uh, pipeline that um, for many, many years, for I think about 15 years, uh, had been agreed upon by both the Palestinian Authority and the, uh, and the uh, Israeli civil administration in principle, but in practice uh, was not moving forward because they couldn't agree on the route 
um, we uh, entered into that discussion with the Palestinian Water Authority and the civil administration and said, we want to help. So the Israeli army officer who was in charge said, okay, great, come with me. Took us on a, uh, a, a tour of the West Bank, showed us where this wastewater treatment pipeline would, would be able to be built, bringing treated water from the Ramallah area down to the Jericho area where it would be used by farmers. At the end of that uh, tour, he handed us this map and said, here's four routes that we approve of, the Israeli civil administration. Take them to the Palestinian Water Authority because we're not talking to them. We took it to the Palestinian Water Authority. We said, here's four uh, routes. Uh, we want you to recommend uh, which uh, route you, uh, you uh, approve of. They took it. They did a report, came back to us and said, okay, here's our report. Take our name off it put your name on it, give it to the Israelis because we're not talking to them. We brought it back to the Israeli officer. He looked at it, he opened up and said, oh great, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, the route one, that we, one of the routes that we had approved of. We said, okay, um, it, now we can have a meeting. The Israeli officer said, now we can meet with the Palestinians. He invited the Palestinian Water Authority to come a week later. They walked into the room. They said uh, they saw the report on the table. The head of the delegation who had written the report saw the report on the delegation. He picked it up, he looked at it, and he says, oh, we can live with this. And that's how we uh, managed to get, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, that's how we managed to get uh, that, uh, that project uh, moving forward. Um, and so those are just a few examples of some of the ideas that we've tried to bring to the, to the table and on the ground, uh, because we believe that what we do, what we study, what we teach is important, but if it can't be actualized, if it can't be applied, then what does it mean? And we hope that by doing this, we are able to create a model, one, for relationship building, to be able to prove that yes, we can work together, and two, in order to uh, improve lives, and three, in order to present options for wider solutions for the region. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, David. Um, as MC, I have the privilege not just to uh, talk about subject matter, but to deal with the really important stuff. So I've been instructed to tell you that if you have uh, parked your car here outside and you have not gone through our registration, you may live to regret it. So please, if you have a car here and you need a parking ticket stamped or whatever, uh, please, on your way out, stop at the registration desk. Um, as I said at the very beginning, uh, this event is taking place uh, uh, in many ways in uh, honor of uh, uh, this prestigious group of uh, Oxford scholars who are visiting us and uh, who have done uh, amazing work throughout this week and no doubt will continue. And um, in the next uh, uh, large portion of our uh, event, we will uh, dive a little bit into the uh, work that they have been doing. Uh, but in order to uh, introduce the, um, how should I call it, the Oxford Martin School program in general, uh, and this specific one, um, I will ask uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Richard Kaplan, who is co-investigator on the Oxford Martin Program on Transboundary Resource Management, and who is a professor of international law, which means that the stuff he talks about, I can actually understand. Um, uh, so he will uh, come and introduce uh, the program and uh, then we will hear some more specific uh, findings from uh, the other colleagues of his. Here you go, Richard, thank you. Danny, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be back among friends uh, in the region. And um, I just say, personally, it was for me a great pleasure to no, Noam Siegel, very briefly, very sadly, because it was so, so brief. But I want to just start with a reflection on 
uh, Noam, because Noam had an ambition, an ambition to harness scientific knowledge for the purpose of meeting some of the most pressing environmental challenges of our time. And the Oxford Martin program on transboundary uh, research, uh, transboundary resource management has been conceived with the same ambition in mind, funded by the Oxford Martin School at the University of Oxford. The program aims to promote practical cross-border cooperation on natural resources in the Nile River Basin and the Jordan River Basin. And for purposes of our meeting this evening, I'm going to be focusing and we're going to be focusing on the work that we're doing in the Lower Jordan River Basin. Thank you. Well, um, here we are. David um, alluded already uh, to the environmental stresses in the region, of which there are many. These are, of course, only uh, too familiar uh, to you, including, of course, um, climate change, uh, increased demand for water and energy, uh, pollution of various kinds. David has just talked about um, groundwater pollution, uh, air pollution as well, contamination of the soil, um, population growth, um, growing pressures as a consequence of the growing populations, including refugees, of course, uh, many of them fleeing uh, s some of the most violent conflicts that the region has known for some time, as well as the increased carbon emissions throughout uh, the region. And these are shared, many of them shared in common challenges. They're not unique to one country, one territory, but they are common across the region. And associated with them are various national and regional risks. The um, uh, degraded environment uh, and increased d uh, demands on resources leading to um, health and disease risks uh, within and between the countries. We saw this very uh, evidently, of course, through the uh, COVID pandemic, which did not in any way respect um, um, borders, political borders. Um, the inhibition, stifling of economic uh, development opportunities as a consequence of poor and declining water and energy resources the increased risk of both social and political tensions posing sometimes very real, anticipated real existential threats in the region that have the prospect of, of spilling over and for that reason, um, risking political and sociability on a wider regional uh, basis. And um, so we ask ourselves, how can these challenges uh, best be met, how can they best be, be managed, and with a focus specifically on growing pressure on uh, energy, on scarce water supplies, and increasing demand for sustainable sources of energy, we set out effectively to test two propositions, which are here on the screen. One, that cross-border cooperation on resource management can yield greater environmental and economic benefits than national siloed approaches will. But at the same time, we recognize that national measures can be taken, and examples of that would be wastewater treatment or the reduction of, of water leakage that can also increase resilience throughout the region. So we have, um, an approach which you're going to see in the presentations that, that follow that consist of several different elements. And I should start by saying that one, I think, distinctive characteristic feature of this program is that it's interdisciplinary, bringing together environmental scientists, engineers, political scientists, diplomats, industry experts, community leaders, 
I think that this is uh, very unusual for the kind of work that is being done in this area. We also employ a unique modeling and approach. And in a few moments, I'm going to introduce our colleague, uh, Professor Jim Hall, who will tell you about the modeling that we've been doing um, to generate scenarios for how resources and infrastructure can be managed effectively in transboundary regions. We also consult with local stakeholders and local experts. Again, this goes back to the point that David made. It is not Oxford helicoptering in to uh, tell people in the region uh, how things can be managed differently. We consult very, very closely for various reasons, to analyze, to gather and analyze data, to develop proposals for new infrastructural and institutional arrangements, both small and large, to manage transboundary environmental pressures. And in the same spirit, we work with former senior uh, officials nationally and internationally. One of them is, is Danny Sheck, in fact, um, to help us uh, understand both the obstacles and the opportunities for making progress in this very important uh, area of, um, of cooperative resource management. And we're in trying to encourage new ways of thinking, new ways of thinking in particular about security in the region um, that takes account of the existential threat that environmental stresses pose. So transcending the traditional conceptions of security that have characterized thinking for so long in this region. Uh, and um, finally, uh, just to say a little bit about what we've identified as ways forward, one is to, in line with what I've just been saying, um, help to construct, help to promote new ways of thinking, new narratives of environment, of, uh, of national security that, as I said, take into consideration the environmental dimension. Also to promote joint discussion with Israel, the Palestinian Authority, and Jordan on respective future energy and water plans. And we've been very successful in doing that in this trip, uh, meeting with um, officials across the region. Um, also uh, promoting joint local renewable energy and water projects. Uh, David has referred to some of these on a small scale, uh, but we're also thinking large scale uh, about um, projects, for instance, um, solar fields uh, in Jordan on a much larger scale uh, that could contribute to a mitigation of the pressures of the challenges that we're, we're facing in the region. Um, joint research and development, uh, and also taking advantage of the uh, rapprochement uh, between Israel and Gulf states to promote possible investment and regional cooperation. I have to say that um, everything that we've been able to do in the region, we've only been able to do with the support of uh, the Arva Institute's uh, Environmental Studies Track 2 Forum, uh, which has opened the door. They have tremendous experience and links. We are building on the experience that they have and really developing our work, I would say, in the same spirit of fostering uh, trust among parties, recognizing that uh, we can only really build a future uh, together to address these problems in, in um, conditions of trust. And I just want to conclude with a, um, an excerpt from uh, a study that um, our own Deborah Sandler, um, um, Mike Herzog, and Raith Al-Omari published with the um, Israel uh, uh, National Security Studies uh, Institute. And I'll just read uh, I think a, a, a section from this which I think speaks very clearly to the uh, compelling reason for the program that we're presenting to you this evening. Without intervention, the alarming threats of rising temperatures, mismanagement of dwindling natural resources, and interdep interdependent water, energy, and food resources can lead to insecurities and health pandemics 
along with surges of refugees, civil unrest, and an increased risk of internal or external war. And I don't think that this is an exaggeration. This is uh, the future I fear that we face in the absence of uh, effective intervention. So I now want to turn the podium over remotely. Unfortunately, um, Professor Jim Hall is not able to be with us in person. Uh, but just to introduce um, Jim, who is the principal investigator of the Oxford team, he's the professor of climate and environmental risks in the School of Geography and the Environment at Oxford University. And he's going to talk with us about the modeling that is being done uh, in support of the work of this program. Thank you very much indeed, Richard, for that introduction. And I'd uh, like to begin, as others have done before me, in uh, recognizing Noab Siegel and the contribution that he made um, to initiating this Oxford Martin School program on transboundary resource management. Um, Noam was uh, quite uh, unique in his perspective and his capacity to bring together different uh, disciplinary approaches, which is reflected in the design of this program, which combines quantification and modeling to give a, a sense of proportion of the natural resource problems that are faced in the region with uh, understanding of the politics, the diplomacy, the international relations, and thirdly, um, learning from action on the ground from the track two program, which we've heard about, which helps to overcome uh, practical barriers and make first steps towards collaborative action. And I see those things as being um, the three pillars of this Oxford Martin School program. Uh, in a moment, I'll hand over to my um, two colleagues, uh, Michael Gilmont and Aman Majid, uh, who are going to talk about the uh, analysis and modeling work that they've been doing in water and energy, respectively, um, working closely with our partners in the region. Um, but I'll just say a few introductory words um, to kind of set the scene for what that modeling is about and, and why it's important. Uh, as I say, it is just uh, one of the three pillars of this program, but it, it's an important pillar because it gives a sense of proportion. Um, it provides a, a context for the track two activities in terms of understanding the scale of the challenges that we face at the moment and the ways in which those challenges might evolve going into the future. Um, we're using the tools of quantified systems analysis of modeling um, uh, for people who are not versed in these techniques. They can possibly see um, uh, uh, remote, possibly even alienating. But what, as you will see from um, Michael and Aman, is that we're quantifying the sources of water and energy, um, quantifying the ways in which those resources um, are being used, um, both at the present and um, in future scenarios. Um, these are um, uh, models that work on different time scales. The energy model, because of the time of day variation in the use of energy and the supply of renewable energy um, from solar panels and the wind varies from hour to hour. This has to be an hourly model, whereas the variation in, in water um, is over longer time scales and we can work on an annual time scale with the water systems analysis. But in both cases, um, we're using um, uh, these models to have dialogue with partners in the region to develop shared understanding 
and shared scenarios for the future. In water, as you'll hear from Michael, um, and I certainly don't want to steal the thunder from either of my colleagues, but to set the scene at least, um, we've already seen the situation of a degraded aquatic environment, um, uh, flows in the Jordan River, um, a tenth of what they were naturally, um, the Dead Sea um, lowering its elevation, um, untreated wastewater being discharged um, both onto land, onto what is, and into the sea, um, groundwater levels um, going down, and uh, groundwater aquifers becoming um, polluted, both with waste and with saltwater intrusion. Um, meanwhile, the broad parameters of water in the region are understood. Israel um, is approaching a, a surplus of um, water supply capacity compared to um, the water that's used um, because of um, uh, innovation in uh, desalinization and wastewater reuse and accompanying um, policy and regulatory reforms accompanying that. Um, uh, Jordan also, um, with a combination um, of a, a growing amount of treated wastewater in their plans, the plan for the Aqaba uh, desalination plant and agreements for increased um, transfer um, from Israel to Jordan um, uh, potentially um, has um, uh, can, can cope with some of the increasing demand for water that it faces in the future. Um, it's in Palestine that um, uh, we see the Palestinians facing um, inadequate water resources and um, unaffordable resources. Um, uh, the scenarios we've looked at, um, which Michael will present, um, look at ways in which those gaps um, can be filled and some steps can be taken to restoring the aquatic environment. Um, but the, looking at that regionally and building in opportunities for cooperation um, open up a, a wider solution space. It's in energy that the world is changing um, most rapidly, however. We see um, dramatically reducing costs of renewables, um, ambitious renewable energy targets across the region, um, including discussion of a commitment um, to net zero um, within Israel. Um, and that together is proving to be a, a game changer. Um, Israel is no longer just looking at um, gas for energy self-sufficiency. Um, Jordan has a way of um, overcoming its historic issue of the cost of fossil fuel imports. Um, the uh, Palestinians have the opportunity um, of affordable and resilient energy systems and um, entering into power purchase agreements with both of their neighbors. Um, which means that they uh, potentially uh, are, are rather more resilient. Of course, we know the barriers as well. Um, they're they're um, uh, political, um, they're to do with the practicalities of um, permits on the ground. Um, there are also issues of grid capacity, of whether grids can, uh, can um, absorb all of this renewable energy. Um, but these are uh, problems which um, via track two and the experience on the ground, um, there are potential cooperative solutions. And in our um, presenting this work in the region um, last week, I just came back from um, Israel on Friday, um, we presented the simulation model that you'll see in a moment from Amman and it um, uh, was met with a great deal of um, enthusiasm and excitement, um, uh, both uh, by the energy minister in uh, the Palestinian Authority and um, within the energy ministry in Israel. Um, they um, want to um, get their hands on this model, um, kick the tires, um, validate it in their own minds, as I'm sure um, the Jordanians will um, when the work is presented to them this week. Um, and we are very enthusiastic about um, building capacity 
um, uh, via training. Um, we're thinking of a joint workshop, which would have technical delegates um, from all three jurisdictions, um, training in systems modeling, um, and analysis of jet energy futures, which would also gradually build up the capacity of delegates to use this modeling system um, and challenging the participants in the workshop to develop future pathways um, as well as exploring the, the, the barriers and thinking through how a, a joint technical working group might be configured in the future. And we hope that by the end of um, that workshop, we'll be able, the delegates themselves will be able to present what they've learned and some potential pathways and, and uh, into the future. That all is tentative plans for now. Um, and forgive me for um, perhaps running ahead a little bit in terms of what our next steps might be. But um, before I, I hand over to our modelers, I wanted to give some sense that um, we're, of, we're thinking about the next steps um, for this program in partnership um, with the Araba and Track2 and other partners in the region. And with that, I'll hand over to my colleagues to go into a little more depth in the modelling results. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, so we'd like to uh, uh, we'd like to uh, hear from uh, two of our three, actually, of our experts. Uh, but I'd just like uh, to take a moment to say that we, in the Track Two uh, Environmental Forum, and in general. Uh, you know, the people active around the Arava Institute and Damour and uh, all these organizations, we sort of live in a kind of cloud where everything uh, works well, but occasionally we are uh, reminded of uh, uh, realities on the ground. Uh, so I'd like to take a moment just to welcome our Palestinian partners from uh, Damour who uh, were held up by an, how should I call it, an uncooperative Israeli checkpoint, uh, but they are here now, so I'd like to welcome them, uh, uh, Ashraf Ajrami, who is uh, co-chair of uh, 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 Track 2, uh, Tahani Abudaka, our friend who's uh, in charge of so many wonderful projects in, in Gaza, and Dr. Shadad Atili, who will join us on a panel uh, a little bit uh, later. Um, so we will uh, start with the first presentation on uh, energy. Um, to introduce this, we will, uh, we will welcome Dr. Aman Majid, who is a research associate at the Oxford Martin School's program on transboundary resource management, focusing on the Jordan Basin. And on this project, project he is uh, leading the model development to map sustainable development pathways of the energy and water sectors in Israel. He will do the presentation uh, on uh, energy. He was supposed to be joined by an Israeli colleague, uh, Nurit Gal, uh, but we lost her to uh, the latest version of COVID-19. So he will do it on his own, please. Thanks very much. Um, firstly, I just want to start off by saying that, unfortunately, I only had the very briefest interaction with Noam. Um, a couple of years ago, when I was a PhD student in my first year, um, I reached out to Noam because of his expertise um, and asked for 30 minutes of his time for help with my PhD. Um, he gave me about three hours, so we talked about lots of ideas, and eventually, the ideas we talked about ended up being the first chapter of my thesis. Um, Jim remarked about the fact that Noam had a remarkable ability um, to bring things together. And on this occasion, he brought together the disaster that was my PhD thesis. Um, so my name is Aman Majid. I've been leading some of the energy analysis on this project. Um, so we're as essentially, we're looking at the potential for regional cooperation in the energy system. So first, a bit of background. So as we know, 
everywhere, we need to be reducing CO2 emissions. That's the big challenge uh, to tackle climate change. Um, and because the power sector is one of the largest emitter of CO2 emissions, uh, that's one of the big, big things that we need to target. The graphic on the left here um, is showing you CO2 emissions in Israel, Jordan, and Palestine uh, towards the bottom end. This is on a log scale. So what we see is that they're not, quite, they're not emitting quite as much as the big emitters like China, the US, and the UK, um, but they still need to reduce their CO2 emissions. And that's reflected by the uh, NDC targets, essentially their targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So you can see on the top right there, um, in 2030, Israel wants to decarbonize by about 27%. Jordan has a slightly higher target of 31%. Palestine has these targets for 2040. Uh, there's two targets there. One is dependent on them having a, um, a their own state, uh, which is 26.6%, and the business as usual scenario is 17.5. Now, decarbonization goes hand in hand with increasing renewable energy. Uh, so this bottom right table here is showing you the renewable energy targets in the region. So today we see Israel has about 8.5% of renewables in its system. That needs to jump up to about 30% by 2030. Uh, so there's a big gap there. Jordan is around 20% and it has this very ambitious target to increase to about 50% renewables by 2030. And Palestine is around 5%, which needs to increase by 20 uh, to 20% 20 by 2030. And the way that's gonna happen is these big uh, fossil fuel plants like coal and gas, they're gonna be decommissioned and gradually renewables will increase. There's a big question around speed and scale. So are, is, are those targets enough or do you need to do more? And most of the recent evidence from uh, organizations such as the IPCC, the IEA, show that we need to go much faster and quicker. Sorry, much faster and with, at a greater scale. So this graphic on the right, which I actually can't see, but um, it shows where Israel and Jordan are at the moment. We don't have data for Palestine, so we couldn't plot it. Um, and by 2030, we need to be down uh, to around 50 to 125 grams of CO2 for every bit of energy that we produce. Um, and essentially we need to go really, really quickly here and reaching net zero by 2050, essentially producing zero carbon uh, from uh, energy systems. So now I'll give you a little bit of um, insight into the energy landscape in the region. So this graphic here shows firstly the power system in the region. Uh, where we can see that there's basically no connectivity between uh, Jordan and Israel. There's some connectivity between uh, Jordan and the West Bank. Um, and Egypt, Jordan, Syria, etc. are connected in this pan-Arab grid. So essentially Israel acts as a, a virtual energy island. Um, the per capita consumption in electricity, we see significant disparities. Basically Israel has um, more electricity per capita than their neighbors. Um, and then the graphic on the right uh, represent, uh, highlights that point and also shows that uh, the Palestinian territories, Gaza and West Bank, are really reliant on imports for their energy needs. Um, yet, there's big potential for solar and wind in the region. So Jordan particularly is one of the best places in the world for solar energy and has some pretty significant wind potential as well. And each region faces some issues. So in Israel, they're really struggling to increase their renewable capacity. Uh, land permits for renewables are hard to get. Um, and there's better potential in their neighbors. Um, and in Jordan, um, essentially there's some grid stability issues and uh, not all renewable energy can be used. You need to match supply of renewables with demand and it's a bit harder to do that in Jordan. And in Palestine, um, power supplies are still unreliable, particularly in Gaza, and they want to increase their energy self-sufficiency. They're mostly reliant on imports at the moment, and they want to change that. So that brings me on to our project. What we want to do is map uh, energy systems to 2030, considering three things. Those decarbonization goals that I showed before, renewable goals, again, that I showed before, and different, ver different um, levels of regional cooperation. How do we do that? So we set up a model um, 
which takes uh, some inputs. Uh, so we try and map uh, growth projections of population and energy demands into the future, uh, along with some technical stuff that you don't really need to worry about. Um, and then we have some scenarios. So there's uh, varying levels of cooperation between the regions. I'll get onto that in the next slide. Self-sufficiency targets in Palestine, as well as those emissions targets and renewables targets. That then feeds into the model. What it does first is uh, plans capacity. So it builds stuff. It builds some gas and solar and wind and things like this. And then it simulates the performance of the energy system with whatever you've built and the sort of configuration of the network. And what we get out of it is uh, some capacity estimates, uh, costs, technology mixes, the expected emissions, and so on. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't do a live demo for you. I'm sure you would have been really, really excited to see that. Uh, but so these are some snapshots of the uh, models that we've developed and the data platforms. So the one on the left actually is the water one. And then on the right, we've got the power system um, data portal. And if you're really, really interested, you can go look at the code online. It's all open source. Um, I really encourage it. Um, so here are the scenarios that we're looking at. Um, so essentially on these axes, we've got uh, on the Y, increasing decarbonization ambition. So And on the X, we've got increasing cooperation. So one scenario is no cooperation. That's denoted by NCO, meaning every uh, region acts like an energy island. Israel does its own thing. West Bank does its own thing. Jordan does its own thing. Um, then there's a business as usual, so we just go as we currently are, the status quo, and see what happens. And uh, there's a full cooperation scenario denoted by that COO, and that's the acronym that you need to be looking out for in the, in the following slides. All scenarios consider future demands, renewables targets, and also Palestinian self-sufficiency, which is targeted at 30% by 2030. So here are some preliminary results. Um, firstly, what we see is that cooperation uh, is a lot cheaper. So it costs about $18.3 billion, um, which is, sounds like a, quite a bit. Um, and that's reducing costs by about 9.4% uh, relative to the status quo scenario. Uh, so that's a fairly substantial reduction. And what we see also is that investment in Jordan increases by about 2.4 times. And the reason for that is because, okay, so this graphic is showing you the build out of various technologies. Essentially, the thing you need to know is that most of the solar is built in Jordan in a fully cooperative scenario. They've got a higher potential and most of the uh, renewable energy is then exported to Jordanians, uh, Jordan's neighbors. And overall, you see a lot less build out of renewable energy. So that decreases by about 24%. So you just need less solar panels to meet those targets to 2030. Um, and uh, accordingly, you need to increase uh, solar capacity in Jordan quite a bit more uh, under a cooperative scenario. As I said before, there's increased investment there. Now, meeting uh, renewables targets and increasing renewables isn't quite as simple as just building out loads of solar and wind. Uh, you also need to balance the grid a lot more because renewables are variable. Um, and what we also observe is that in a cooperative system, you can do that a lot better. So you get about 20% uh, more utilization of renewables. So every unit of renewable energy you produce, you can use more of that in a cooperative system. This uh, trade-off curve uh, shows the effect of Palestine's self-sufficiency targets. Um, its effect on the total installed capacity in Israel on the left and Palestine on the right. Um, and essentially on the x-axis here, you increase self-sufficiency all the way to up to 100%. Um, and what we see is that if Palestine was to go uh, fully self-sufficient, you would need about 8% less capacity in Israel. But that does come at a significant cost in, uh, for Palestine. So you need about 12 times the capacity that they have today to get them to 100% self-sufficiency. Um, this is probably the most interesting slide for me in this whole thing. Um, so this is looking at um, essentially hitting net zero by 2050, that issue around speed and scale that I was talking about before. 
So on the x-axis here, we're gradually increasing renewables in the system, meaning we're decarbonizing accordingly. And what we see here is that under a cooperative system, you have to spend about 22% le less um, to hit net zero. That is a really, really significant cost at the scale that we're talking about. So about $47 billion uh, worth of savings there. Um, but what's interesting is that um, around 80%, uh, so the orange bars are non-cooperative and the green bars are the cooperative scenarios. So around 80% renewables, you have really, really big, um, big benefits there. But when you increase up to like 90 to 95% renewables, like really, really, really pushing your decarbonization targets, then the uh, benefits diminish there. Um, and that's primarily because of that load balancing issue that I was talking about before. So some conclusions, what have we learned? Um, so firstly, cooperative energy planning and management has significant benefits, reduces costs by about 28%, improves renewable energy uptake and reduces curtailment. Um, pursuit of self-sufficiency is really challenging, uh, primarily because it's really hard to utilize those renewables um, and it costs twice as much uh, compared to the, actually it's not quite that much, that's an error, but anyway, it costs quite a, uh, quite a lot more. And um, it's got very large costs, uh, particularly for Palestine. And in terms of scale and ambition, cooperating could help us reach net zero much more efficiently. Um, and I think that's it for me. Yeah, so thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Aman. That was uh, really uh, impressive um, to see this uh, work uh, and uh, the results coming coming out of all that uh, that work. So we will move on to a presentation on uh, uh, in within the same project, but on uh, water management. Uh, water has always been uh, on the agenda of every discussion about the future of the Middle East. Uh, I remember many, many years where the, you know, the conventional wisdom was that the next war in the Middle East would be about water, uh, to which uh, the late Shimon Peres always used to say, yes, but it can also be the first uh, topic of cooperation between the regions. Why, why simply the reason for war? And this is uh, roughly the idea behind, <laughs> behind our project. So uh, to present... Uh, the water findings, I will uh, invite uh, uh, two people, actually, who will uh, present uh, each uh, part of the findings. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Suleiman Khalash, uh, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute for Science, Innovation and Society at the University of Oxford. And uh, in his uh, civilian life, he's uh, also director of the Jordanian consulting firm Eye Greens, which uh, focuses on energy, water, and environment. Suleiman, please. Uh, actually, before you come, I will also introduce the next speaker, so I don't have to interrupt. No, you can come on. You can you can stand by me, Suleiman. I uh, I don't bite. I promise. Uh, the, the next speaker on the topic will be Dr. Michael Gilmont, who is the program manager uh, for the Oxford Martin Program on Transboundary Resource Management and also a research fellow, and his research applies interdisciplinary political, economic, and hydrological approaches to analyzing trends in water resources, uh, water resource development, use, and reform, with particular focus on the MENA region. Uh, admit that I read this as if I understood what I was reading. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Uh, can I just get just let me get out of here? Um, good evening. So I'm um, Suleiman Halasa, and uh, I'm uh, proud to be uh, in the same group that Noam was, which is uh, uh, alumni of the Arava Institute for Environmental Study. I studied there almost uh, 14, 15 years ago, very long time ago. Let's say that. Um, I just want to also to start with mentioning how our uh, last week uh, went and what's going on this week. So um, um, we started by having meetings with different um, 
um, governmental agencies in both Israel and Palestine. Um, so we met with uh, both the energy ministries in uh, uh, the Israeli Ministry uh, of Energy and also the, uh, uh, we met the Palestinian uh, Minister of Energy. Uh, the water authorities, both in uh, in the Israeli water, water uh, authority and the Palestinian water authority, and thanks to, um, I think Leah is also here. Thank you very much, Leah, for hosting us and Adel. Uh, we also met the um, uh, negotiations team at um, uh, in the Palestinian Authority, and we heard from them their uh, uh, their vision about what's going on, what's their role, and how uh, uh, they. Uh, uh, they perceive and they see the work that we are doing. Uh, we got very interesting feedback from all of them. Like it's for me, it's the first time that I see Israelis and Palestinians agreeing on something, which is the outcome or the, the suggestions that we have in this project, which is very very um, interesting for uh, at least for me at personal level. Um, we visited the startup nations as well, and uh, Sigali is here. Thank you for uh, for coming. Uh, very interesting work there, and I think there is a great potential for involving the private sector in the work that we are doing. We need the private sector and the uh, b b entrepreneurs in a way to come up with the creative ideas of how the output or the outcomes of, uh, of this work can be implemented. Um, today we met with the President's Forum uh, for Climate Change. Uh, we met with the Jordanian Ambassador in, uh, in uh, the State of Israel. Um, in the rest of this week, we are going. We are going to Jordan. We'll meet with also similar the water and energy sectors and uh, different think tanks over there. That actually, hopefully, we will make also new connections between the different um, players in in the region. So, I would like also to emphasize um, a major finding that we saw here. It's like um, among the three different uh, jurisdictions, it's very very interesting to see that actually each one of them was mainly focusing on their own. Uh, uh, resources in the national uh, planning. So if we talk about water and energy, they looked and as uh, a man already uh, showed that uh, Israel as, uh, uh, as an uh, energy island shows that very well. Like it's, they don't see any potential in working regionally um, without, you know, without uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, looking into what is the, uh, what's happening uh, next door, how the neighbors are planning also their uh, their national strategies, um, and uh, what we are proposing is may maybe by looking regionally and trying to understand what's happening at the regional level, we can come up with more sustainable and uh, efficient solutions for that. So talking about this, if we move to the water, which I think we all of us agree that, um, how to start the presentation here? Yes, so I think all of us agree that we have very limited water resources in the Middle East, which is uh, resulting or making the situation of supplying water uh, very uh, stressful, taking into consideration the population growth, the, um, the willingness for every party to increase their per capita water share, and the climate change effect on the water resources, uh, which emphasizes the need of being more creative and create more water, uh, uh, thinking out of the box and create more water resources uh, uh, to achieve or to uh, address that deficit. What we are proposing is a regional uh, approach uh, to solve the water issues, mainly by looking into uh, water sharing, political uh, or policy uh, uh, changes, and also using the technology for uh, water resources. Um, Saying that, I would like to give the floor to my colleague Marti uh, Mar Martin, <laughs> Michael Gelmont, <laughs> uh, to uh, go deeper in the, uh, the model and the analysis that he's been working on for the last few years. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, um, and thank you, um, everyone, for, for attending tonight. I, I have the privilege of supporting Noam in the drafting of the, the Oxford Martin um, program and it has really been a, an honor and a privilege to have been uh, kind of managing the team at the coalface under the uh, under the academic leadership of, of Richard Jim and Javier over the last uh, three years as we have turned or tried to turn some of Noam's uh, Noam's vision for this work into into uh, into reality um, so 
So in mind, you've, you've mentioned a bit about this as a background of, of water. If you can have the slide back on, please. So what have we been trying to achieve? What is the added value of the research that we're doing on water? Water is very well studied in this region, um, but there are still gaps, and we think gaps that are very much worth exploring. So the first cut of our analysis has really been trying to achieve an in-depth analysis of national scale data from Palestine, West Bank and Gaza, Jordan and Israel, and delivering what we hope is and will be a nearly consistent data set with importantly similar uh, accounting and definition of resources, both at the national scale and as we drill down at the, at the sub-national scale as well, so we can start to spatially map what water is used and going where. Um, we're doing this by working with in-country stakeholders, working with those professionals who have uh, who've kindly um, agreed to, to come along with us um, to identify, pull out, refine uh, the data and, and the accounting. Uh, we are then using this, uh, this data to try to produce regional scenarios for the future of water management. Um, and importantly, linking in with, with track two is using the analysis of, of data, presentation of scenarios, development of scenarios as a convening space for bringing professionals together. Professionals who, for political reasons, otherwise wouldn't necessarily talk to each other, but who can come together um, over data in a personal capacity um, to try and iron out some of the uncertainties and gaps in knowledge. Next slide, please. I should press the button, shouldn't I? There we go. It's easier just to request. Um, so our assessment of water use, which I'm going to present in a minute, which Jim has already alluded to, uh, as this first cut uses official government national sources. Um, and we've tried as much as possible to minimize the transformation of that data, so it should really still look familiar to um, those who are working with it day in, day out. And we've used it to try and assemble this regional picture of both historic over the past decade or so and future to 2030 and hopefully to beyond uh, water supply. Included in this is then the impact of growth in per capita consumption in West Bank and Gaza and in Jordan um, and how, as well as popula with population growth, this really compounds future demands for resources. And what this work shows is that based on current plans through to 2030, there is a deficit in uh, what is planned to be supplied in terms of available resources versus anticipated um, demand. I should say that these numbers will change. There are new plans being worked on, especially in Ramallah and, uh, and in Amman at the moment. Um, and we will hopefully over the next few months be updating this uh, according to these new numbers. So what does this analysis show? So firstly, for Israel, as already been alluded to, I should say these slides were produced last week, and in light of our conversations over the past seven or so days, there will be changes to the numbers, if not hopefully the, the overall message. Um, we see in Israel a relatively steady um, allocation for domestic, um, domestic consumption, uh, driven just by population growth. Uh, we see a steady... Uh, slightly growing amount of agricultural water, um, mainly uh, growing through treated wastewater. And we see that while, um, while there's a growth in demand, we actually, the potential for growth in supply is a lot greater to 2030. We expect that excess supply to come down as we understand the numbers a little more. The corollary is it could very well go up in light of the, of the Green Blue Deal between Jordan, UAE, and, and Israel. So the final version of these numbers uh, while uh, not necessarily uh, with different assumptions, might very well actually have similar numbers. So Israel, potentially, there's a surplus of 300 million cubes per year. Take that with a large, large pinch of salt. Um, but that's, that's one picture. For Jordan, by contrast, we see a uh, rough balance as of 2019 and, and, uh, and recent years. Um, but by 2030, a, a gap between anticipated demand and, um, and available supply by about 116 million cubic meters. Again, that number is probably gonna be revised down with new water sharing with Israel and with increased uh, desal capacity at Aqaba. Um, but this is the current state of the analysis based on official reports. 
For Palestine, we see a much more stark um, picture, one from balance, albeit undersupply at a very low level of, of per capita use, currently 49 meters cubed per capita per year, um, growing 2030 due both to population growth and to increase in per capita supply to 71 um, cubic meters per year, and also an increase in agricultural uh, supply for irrigation based on growing population, growing desire for food security, and growing utilization of irrigable land. So what that has the effect in doing is uh, potentially seeing a deficit of 431 million cubes per year. So that's the gap between, thank you, the gap between uh, planned demand and planned supply. So if we now look at all three graphs, sorry for the slight overlap, I think this is probably the first time we're actually seeing comparable numbers, albeit with a pinch of salt, uh, on the same scale, actually a different scale, sorry, <laughs> the scales are not adjusted, but the planned numbers for the future of the region um, laid out next to each other um, in quite a dramatic fashion. Um, so what does this allow us to start doing? Well, it allows us to start playing around with numbers at the regional scale. If we potentially take into account some kind of Israeli surplus, we can reduce the um, regional deficit. Um, and we can then start to play around with new options for supply. So that can include treated wastewater, starting to move towards the levels of recovery that Israel is achieving in terms of the amount of domestic water sent back into the agricultural sector at a lower energy intensity to de than desalination. We see new options for desalination combined with recycling, uh, actually producing a significant amount of addition to the overall water economy. We see the potential to revisit agricultural water growth targets in line with agricultural water productivity and general gains in the region. We see potential for improving leakage in new areas of supply. Um, and we see the potential, we will hopefully be mapping out, potential for regional water sharing, geographical transfers, especially with new desalination capacity. So here is one possible scenario of a deficit across the region of 246 million cubes that could be achieved with Recycling alone at 50% recovery in Palestine and in Jordan. Alternatively, 30% recycling with a reduction in agricultural water um, use. Still growth, but a reduction in the ultimate target. I mentioned that uh, this deficit wasn't the full story. Um, if we consider environmental sustainability of use, so eliminating over-abstraction of groundwater, redressing uh, the undrinkable groundwater in Gaza, redressing the over-abstraction of groundwater, of renewable groundwater in Jordan, we actually see the regional deficit not at 240-something, but at 544. What are the options then to redress that much larger gap? And again, we have two possible initial scenarios. These are very much just illustrative. They are, they are to be refined in conjunction with our, with our partners. But um, yeah, so we've got either an option of enhanced wastewater and desal or agricultural growth reduction, enhanced wastewater and desal. So what we're arguing is that a regional approach really offers a larger solution space uh, for addressing deficit and dealing with impacts of climate change and building resilience within the water uh, system as a whole. Um, we hope or we believe that additional desal capacity and expertise can offer stability and resilience to both the environment and to the water supply system. Treated wastewater growth, or I think as it's being increasingly called in, uh, in the West Bank and Gaza, agricultural water, um, can offer development of new capacity with much less energy, about a third of the energy of uh, seawater desalination. So if we're talking about water energy nexus, there are potential huge gains here. However, as again, as David referred to with Albire, the development of these resources requires regional cooperation. In fact, in, in the issue of, of infrastructure crossing area C, very close regional cooperation. I'm being asked to finish up. Um, so the next steps, we clearly need to refine our numbers and our scenarios through consultation with our stakeholders. We've started that process. Uh, we would like to co-develop further scenarios with our regional stakeholders. We're then engaging closely with track two to identify how these big picture numbers can actually be converted to action on the ground. So crudely, could you meet the Palestinian wastewater need by building 30 Albire trunk lines? You probably wouldn't want to do that, but what are the scalable options that, that could be proposed around that? And then the final element of our, of our future steps is, is what Jim referred to in terms of training and capacity building in region, but also creating a forum for regional knowledge sharing um, across both future resource plans, 
resource gaps, infrastructure and policy solutions. And our conversations over the last few days in Jerusalem, Tel Aviv and Ramallah have really identified, I think, a strong need for this and have identified some very illuminating um, assumptions or cross purposes uh, in terms of assumptions um, across decision makers that I think there is a tremendous opportunity to clarify. Um, again, importantly, that sort of engagement will occur at the, at the professional rather than political level um, and will be based on developing understanding rather than assumptions. This is all obviously also subject to funding. Um, I think that wraps me up. It does. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suleiman and uh, Michael. Uh, the final portion of uh, our program will be a conversation that I will manage with uh, four of our friends here, who I will ask to join me on stage. Uh, Deborah Sandler, Tariq Abuhamad, Shadad Atili, and Gil Murciano. Okay, so um, this will be a conversation about the regional dimension of our work and the importance of the regional dimension. We gave it the title of uh, Threats and Opportunities in the Region uh, in the Realm of uh, Environment. Um, knowing our friends, I think there will be more talk about opportunities than threats, but we will see how this goes. Um, we don't have very much time, so uh, I will warn the panelists that uh, if you have something important to say to answer my question, say it at the beginning, because you may not get to the end. Um, so I'd like to uh, I'd like to start with uh, uh, Dr. Tarek uh, Abu Hamad, who is the executive director of the Arava Institute for environmental studies. Uh, Tarek is a long time uh, collaborator at the Institute. He was a teacher, he was uh, uh, the uh, academic director and for the past uh, year he has been the executive director and is uh, as such of course uh, heavily involved also in the track two part of our work. So uh, Tarek, um, the Arava Institute of obviously is uh, no stranger to the concept of uh, 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 regional cooperation and in general and in particular on environmental issues. But Track 2 has in a way uh, broken you out of the bubble of uh, Kibbutz Ktura and the campus uh, into the big, uh, the big wide world. So, um, my question to you is, uh, how is life in the real world? Okay. So, you know, the, the real world works, uh, it's very dynamic all the time. You mentioned that we are a, a bubble in the in the Arava, but this bubble been encouraging regional cooperation since its establishment, and we are very glad to see that many organizations in uh, in the region, especially in Israel now, having the regional cooperation on their uh, on their agenda. We joined a, the COP26 in, uh, in Glasgow, and one of the nice conclusions that came out of Glasgow that international cooperation on the climate is a must, and regional cooperation is a must. And we've been doing this for the last 25 years. And our next steps is to go beyond this region, to in internationalize the work that we do, that's why we apply to the United Nations environmental uh, program and I'm very honored to 
tell you that we are accredited a member now of the UN uh, Environment uh, Assembly of the UN EEP. We are also in the process of uh, getting the membership of the UN FCC in, uh, in the United uh, Nation. And uh, we want to take this work one step uh, further to do regional cooperation, which is based on science evidence. That's why we work with uh, with Oxford University projects and uh, ideas for regional cooperation. There are plenty of uh, of them, but only few of them are really uh, based on scientific uh, values and uh, and data. And currently, we are planting the seeds for another project, also with uh, with Harvard University on uh, environmental, uh, international environmental uh, cooperation. So, um, yeah, but uh, maybe a little bit uh, more specifically, do, do how does the uh, the fact that you are now not just dealing with students and with research? impact the work of the of the institute in uh, in the involvement in in real life projects look the 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 work of the Araba institute is based on building trust between the partners or the stakeholders that deal with environmental uh, with environmental issues and as david said at the beginning taking this one step further and do impact on the uh, uh, on the ground goes beyond the academic program that we that we run. We used to build the trust between the students at the at the Arava Institute, and we want to build the the trust with the partners on the on the region. We have plenty of peace treaties. We have plenty of natural uh, resources and technologies, and we know how to produce water and uh, renewable energies. And what we lack in this region is not the peace treaties or the natural resources. It's the it's the trust in the past we used to chase our partners in the region to do cooperation and now they come to us with the challenges that they face and they ask for a cooperation to design a solution for the challenges that they uh, that they face so we're taking this one step further and as, as i said we want to go beyond that and internationalize the work that we do in the region thank you debbie deborah sandler um a long time uh, teacher at uh, Oxford, um, but also a veteran of uh, research and uh, actual work on uh, environmental issues in these, this region, and currently, uh, luckily for us, uh, co chair of uh, Track 2. Um, thank you very much uh, for your uh, involvement in, in our work. So for many years you've been uh, working on, uh, you've been dealing with various uh, regional aspects of uh, uh, environmental challenges. But as uh, chair of uh, track two, uh, you too entered into the realm of uh, real life uh, on the ground uh, projects together with uh, quite an important layer of uh, diplomacy that uh, needs to accompany it. Um, and uh, maybe uh, most importantly for this evening, you were a crucial link to the Oxford Martin School, uh, which made it actually possible, made this partnership uh, possible. I'd like to uh, ask you about this. Um, what unique dimension does this uh, partnership bring to the area of activity of Track 2 and similar programs in, in, in our region? Thank you very much. Um, my co-chair, Ashraf Ajmani, thank goodness made it, so I just want to say welcome. I'm so glad you asked that question because it's- It was a complete coincidence. It, <laughs> because from when David spoke to when Aman Sulum and Michael spoke, it seems that there's a bit of a gap. And I would like to fill that gap and help you understand what the connection really is. I think that's what you're saying. And how does that impact all of us here? So first of all, from my perspective, Oxford is a track two project. The OMS program is a track two project, which they have successfully taken and run with, but never left us behind. 
the idea came from the region. It came from track two. Noam and I worked on it very hard. Noam then took it to, to Oxford. And everything is based on partnership. It's the track two methodology. It's interdisciplinary, but more importantly, it's not Oxford academics who are running this project. It's Oxford academics with Oxford fellows who were recruited from the region. So right here is our Palestinian fellow, Shadad Atili, who's gonna speak in a few minutes, former water minister of Palestine. We've got um, top people from all over the region and everything that has happened has happened ground up. So the, the philosophy is ground up, top down, based on science. And everyone has been working very hard and very quietly now for two or three years. And it's the first time, first time, you have a team coming together from locals, arguing about needs, looking at the data, getting access to the data, using the same language. We were told yesterday, don't say wastewater treatment in Palestine anymore. Call, <coughs> excuse me, call it agricultural water use. I think um, Michael said that. So we've learned an awful lot from each other and with each other. Now, what you saw tonight is very sophisticated, in-depth modeling for the first time ever in the region. That will provide, this is just phase one, but that data is not what's so interesting to track two in and of itself. What's interesting to track two is how do we take what's come out of that data and use it, leverage it, for the partners in the region to talk and to come up together with the experts, with these world-class um, experts, on scenarios and options that meet each country's needs. So, so in a perfect world, in your mind, uh, after uh, our friends from Oxford have done their presentations, partial results for the moment, maybe in a year, maybe in a couple of years, uh, they will have the final uh, findings. They meet with officials in Israel, in Palestine, in Jordan, in a perfect world, in your mind, what should come out of it? What should be the, the takeaway for the, uh, for the uh, officials in these uh, three countries uh, to work with? Okay, so nobody was clear tonight, because it's not in a few years, it's now. They finished phase one. That's it, we're here. So we've reached sp stage one of the perfect world. We, um, the Energy Ministry of Israel, we're so excited by this, that they called us up at night and said, okay, can you come back in and present it to the electrical authority? You all may not understand this and find it incomprehensible or boring. The professionals love it. They said they've never seen anything like it. We got the same response, which hopefully Shadad will talk about, at the energy ministry in Ramallah. We know, because they've spent so much time in Jordan, today we met with the Jordanian ambassador who said this is so important because we believe we have to cooperate I want to arrange for you to see Prince Hassan this week, like that. So in a perfect world, we first get the professionals to agree. We sign up the professionals across the region. This is track two, so that it's a professional project. And then we go up to the prime minister and presidential levels, and, we, and it's bottom up based on the projects that we've already started in the region they can draw on this information as a strategy to know, wow, how many wastewater treatment plants should we put in in Gaza? So how many trunk lines for El Albiri? But it won't be their decision or our decision, it's everybody's decision in the partnership. That's where we're going with this. Thank you very much, Debbie. Um, Shadad, uh, Dr. Shadad Adili, uh, former Minister of Water and head of the Palestinian Water Authority and uh, currently an advisor uh, close to the minister at uh, nego uh, of the negotiation department and also, as Debbie mentioned, an Oxford uh, fellow who is uh, uh, working with us uh, from uh, the Palestinian side. Shadad, um, 
not everyone knows, as I do, uh, how passionate you are about uh, the issues of uh, uh, the sustainability uh, and uh, um, uh, environmental uh, stability and resilience of uh, Palestine in the future. You are the author of a really fundamental document uh, in that area, uh, which you call the Palestinian Green Deal, and you have authored many uh, articles and spoken in uh, many instances on behalf of the uh, Palestinian Authority uh, about these issues. Uh, I wanted to ask you, how does the issue resonate in, uh, within Palestine, both uh, the leadership and civil society? How seriously is this taken and how uh, how cooperative do you find these uh, parts of Palestinian society to the issue? Uh, uh, good evening to you all. Uh, uh, very glad to be uh, here with you to, tonight. Very glad to be part of Damour and part of Oxford and uh, uh, part of Frac 2. And why it's important to Frac 2, uh, uh, let me tell you a story, uh, Richard. This is why I like DFID and I like the British. British, <laughs> Professor Shamir, it's good to see you here. Uri. So, uh, uh, DFED uh, used to be one of the funder of a project called EXACT. This project that Jordan, Israel, Palestine are working under the multilateral track. And they kept working. In the difficult period, they kept working together. So all people love this project, the EXACT project. And it's about water, okay? Until after several years, we had a meeting in Muscat and Oman, and David stepped in and said, guys, what you're doing is really marvelous, but we will not stay for a minute in this project. So we asked, Yani, if you're saying this is great, why you're leaving? He said, because you're doing a great job, and all of this technical work, it's excellent. But we didn't find the link between the technical and the political. So if your work remain at your circle, we didn't do anything. This is why we're saying you goodbye. Until you find this link, we will be coming back. Why I'm saying this, Debbie? Because this is what has been presented by Aman and Suleiman and uh, Michael. It's very important. And let me tell you, from someone who's politician, and until today I'm still a governmental official, because I'm in my way out. This is the first time that Oxford team has worked on official data, taken from Palestine, taken from Israel, taken from Jordan. And this is the first time they were presenting to the authorities and all people saying, great, and even I'm surprised when I hear our Minister of Energy saying, I'm happy to send our technical people for this joint modeling session. And it was the same for water. This is why my good friend Danny, Ambassador, that the next phase, we have to work on this link. Because frankly, in our coming here this evening, the checkpoint has stopped us. We, we showed our permit. And the, the soldier was smiling, and we said, okay, fine, we will be passing. And then she said, please, aside. And they kept us for a couple of hours. Despite we're telling them we're going for a joint Israeli workshop. Okay, for them, they don't care. And it just it come to my mind that we shouldn't speak to the soldier. We have to speak to the politician who gives orders. And this is why we make a change. Why, now I come to, to answer your question. Because whether we like or we don't like, we are sharing same resources, whether on water or environment and air. It's not of a Palestinian intention, whether they like you or not, to pollute the only source for both of us. And this is applicable on air, and this is applicable on all resources. And this is why, Ambassador, when we became a state, we did sign international agreement on environment. And here's a good news that I'm going to tell you now, that Israel is a signatory to a Basel Convention, Palestine too. 
Israel is a signatory to Desertification Convention, Palestine to Israel is signatory to Paris uh, 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 Protocol for Climate Change, Palestine too. So what's lacking then? If we agree, and there is certain obligation under these convention and international agreement, it's obligation on Palestinian, obligation on Israeli, Suleiman, obligation on Jordanian, because you are also Jordan, part of all these conventions. So, Debbie, please take it to the uh, uh, Presidential Forum for Climate Change. Why we don't sign a regional environmental uh, protocol? Because we don't need, wallahi, to negotiate, because we already negotiated with Basel, with Paris, and we signed. So we take all these items under these conventions and agreement, we, we put it, sorry. It's from, you're you're from, wasting our water. No, no, this is our, this is our water you're taking. So this is part of our water. water. Okay. okay. So, <laughs> so uh, 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 we have to understand something. And this is the second part of the question, Danny. That the politicians, they don't have time to learn, okay, about environment and about hazardous waste, okay. They are taking decisions. And this is a challenge that we have to face, how to educate them, how to get them knowing. And this is good because, uh, uh, Aman, you reflected the numbers in terms of money. People understand money. You, when you tell them you cooperate, this is 12 million, you don't cooperate, it's 18. So you speak to Minister of Finance, Minister of Finance speak to the President, then they make a decision that, okay, go cooperate because that is much cheaper for us. We shouldn't really take them to the model and how the model works, they don't care. They do have other 3,000 things to, to, to work on. But let's just work on this. So in conclusion, yes, sir, we're very much interested about environment and we, we're doing our best and, and we are now harmonizing our local laws with this signed agreement, and we are really in a big mess. Why? Example, Sidao, which is uh, uh, for women. Uh, some people, uh, uh, we, we, we sign without reservation. Israel signed with reservation that anything that without, uh, against the religion, we couldn't. But we did agree for everything, and demonstration everywhere in West Bank against uh, why Palestine joined Sidao. So, no, the story is not because we are demonstrating. The story that we're taking seriously harmonizing our local law with the signed international agreement, and this is applicable on environment. Thank you very much. Um, I must say that uh, our project is riding a certain wave in the sense that we are dealing with subject matter that is very fashionable right now. It has become fashionable. It wasn't at the beginning. Uh, environmental challenges, climate change, etc. And we found, you are right to say, Shada, that you have to find the link to the politicians. I think in a sense there is already the beginning of such a link because on both sides, I know better on the Israeli side than uh, the Palestinian Jordanian, but I hear from our colleagues, uh, I think the, the, the idea is more or less the same, that even political leaders in Israel who are not crazy about the idea of uh, a political settlement currently of the conflict with uh, Palestine, they are very comfortable or quite comfortable to cooperate on what they call civilian issues. And environmental uh, uh, issues uh, is definitely within that realm. In this current government, Luckily, I must say, from the Israeli side, there were cabinet ministers appointed who were from the right side of the, from the left side, but the right, I mean the, the, the correct side, the correct side uh, of the political spectrum. So uh, our Minister of Environmental Affairs met with her uh, Palestinian colleague more than once, and uh, there was a beginning of cooperation, which hopefully will continue uh, after the next uh, political turmoil that this country is uh, plunging into. Um, finally, uh, Gil Mulciano, Dr. Gil uh, Mulciano, uh, who is uh, executive director of uh, the Mitvim Institute, uh, which is a think tank in Israel, uh, focused uh, in particular on uh, uh, regional affairs, 
disclaimer, I have recently been invited to become a member of the board of Mitvim, and I'm very proud and grateful uh, for that offer. Um, but I asked you to join this panel because you come uh, obviously from uh, the, the, the second necessary link to what we're talking about, which is uh, the diplomatic and political or international affairs uh, aspect. And uh, the organization you direct, although it is uh, quite young, has uh, gained, I must say, tremendous uh, prestige in the realm of uh, think tanks in the region and uh, beyond. Its essential subject matter is uh, analysis and uh, prognostics of uh, international relations with a very particular focus on uh, the region, the Middle East and the Mediterranean mostly. Um, so uh, maybe a slightly provocative uh, question. In the title, we speak about threats and opportunities. Which do you prefer? I'd rather not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you very much. I mean, I'm uh, optimistic by nature, but I spent the last three days in the Knesset. So it might not be the right time to ask me about that. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure as a political scientist to be surrounded by so many real scientists, you know, in this situation, obviously. And when you speak about foreign policy, I think that what we are experiencing right now, uh, Debbie spoke about the combination, uh, Shadad spoke about the importance of combining policy with the scientific technological knowledge. But you know, we are on the verge of a revolution, not just on scientific technological affairs or domestic affairs, but also in foreign policy, on the basic practice, on the way we do foreign policy. The uh, alliances or the choice of alliances, the, the narratives, the decision-making structure, are bound to change completely because of the topic of climate change. And in return, of course, the importance of cooperation is vital on the regional level, on international. So obviously, obviously you see an incredible combination here, but even when you look at climate change as a foreign policy issue, you can't ignore the fact that it has a very, a very unique features. You know, this is one of those topics, somewhat of a cliche, just a warning, one of those topics that causes leaders and nations to forget about the immediate constraints and to think, to think long term, you know, to, to think in perspective. And I mentioned it's a, it's a cliche because we've seen a couple of co contradictory cases where climate change could not change the entire situation. I can tell you that at Mitvim, our experience in the last couple of years has been that organizations, civil society, potential partners in countries, uh, with which Israel does not have uh, diplomatic relations um, that wouldn't participate in a multilateral, let alone bilateral discussion with us, climate change changes the situation, the exception to the norm. And the question is whether or not you can take this exception to the norm and help it shape the norm itself on that level, changing the incentive structure to cooperate. So this combination that we are discussing uh, the, this idea of a nexus, of a diplomatic or a political environmental nexus, where you cannot really plan a strategic step, a strategic political step, without it having a environmental logic. And on the other hand, you cannot take a major environmental action without having the policy framework, the political logic. Think about Mubadala and their attempt to uh, build new uh, <laughs> new infrastructure of uh, oil uh, oil pipelines to uh, the Gulf of Elite. I don't know if you had the chance to. Uh, and you know the crown jewel of the Abraham Accords at the time in, to, in 2021, but you know a, a major risk for ecosystem in the region, and therefore did not succeed in the long term. Same thing, by the way, when we speak about the Green Blue Deal, and the major challenge. You know, all the numbers are there. The uh, the uh, resilience or the, uh, the profit, the, the, how lucrative it is basically in the long term. But if you're missing the Palestinian aspect from this trilateral cooperation, can it actually last for long? And then when we think long term, we think about not just you know, climate change as a platform for you know, the, the next big thing in the Abraham Accords, but also reframing normalization. Trickle down effect. You know, until now, 
what we mostly seen, to be honest, in the Abraham Accords is uh, elites, Co a connection between elites, different elites, I have to say, multi-layered, that is changing, but still, point to point. Can you create a trickle-down effect through dealing with human needs, through climate change? And it definitely go up. The bottom up, top down, I'm down for it completely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> but the second issue also is to change the nature. To leverage normalization against the, <laughs> the intentions of the original architects is a tool to promote Israeli-Palestinian peace. Now, I mentioned the three days in the Knesset. Yeah, a total impasse when it comes to leaderships. In Israel, of course, and I don't think it's going to change the split you know, within the Palestinian national movement, but that's the interesting thing about climate change. It's the power of practice without great celebrations. So if you can find, you know, we are trying to always identify those practical steps that does more than just quality of life or, you know, not exactly the economic peace Netanyahu style, but the practical steps that can have political momentum and climate change and the field of renewable energy, food security, uh, uh, water security is exactly the set that provides this set of, uh, of steps. So the revolutionary nature opportunity versus, uh, you know, maybe a necessity to use the opportunity on that level. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Gil. Um, I, I'm hesitant because I have this uh, idea to ask each of you in 60 seconds to give me a one image that you would like to see 10 years from now on this, uh, in this uh, area. Uh, can we? A few more minutes? Sure. So imagine 10 years from now, you know, we have this uh, project. Uh, most of the people on the panel are involved in it. Uh, Gil doesn't know, but he probably will be involved in it in one way or another, because I, I see, I see many, many ways for us to cooperate. Give me one ideal picture that you have in your mind 10 years from now about regional uh, cooperation environmental cooperation. Shadad, do you want to start? The Palestinian I start uh, with ending occupation and also uh, uh, promoting uh, regional uh, uh, cooperation. We shouldn't forget that uh, we're just sitting uh, along the Jordan River and the Dead Sea that is really dying. And despite all efforts uh, uh, between uh, uh, the riparians, especially in the uh, lower part of it, but until today, there is no uh, single step is made uh, forward toward rehabilitation of the river and addressing the shrinkage of the Dead Sea. And this is really a pity. And this is actually, it's a shame on all of us, Israeli, Jordanian, Palestinian, that we look at the Dead Sea, which is a unique heritage of the whole world, a unique uh, a special body that is really dying and uh, we couldn't say stop uh, uh, to such uh, shrinkage. Depoliticizing environment, this is what I really hope in the coming uh, 10 years. Right, thank you. Debbie. I'm gonna get very focused on these Oxford fellows sitting in front of me and these nice gentlemen sitting on either side. And I'm gonna say, from an optimistic point of view, that in 10 years we're gonna create a regional association for climate change and the environment. It's gonna be based on science, which this modeling is starting. It's gonna be, it's gonna be communities of professionals who are gonna have ongoing meetings, and it's gonna be the guiding force for real projects on the ground and for real meetings between presidents, heads of states, and kings, and we're gonna all come together around this common enemy. Thank you. Tarek. Okay, I think when, when we look to the targets that the governments in the region set for themselves to meet net zero emissions by, by 2050, this means that we need to change the way we live, change the way we produce our food, we produce our water, we produce our energy, ways that we run our, uh, uh, our transportation. So I would like to see these goals uh, happening. Uh, partially, but with the pace that we see in Israel, I think this will never uh, will never happen. Uh, and I also would like to see in the 10 years the Regional Climate Change Research Center at the Araba Institute, a hub, a climate change hub that will serve the whole region. Gil. A set of regional forums 
one uh, renewable energy forum, Mediterranean, Middle Eastern in Nicosia. Uh, water in Nicosia, yeah, also incorporating Turkey into the, obviously. No, but I'm, uh, you know, if you have the chance to promote uh, political goals. Second, a uh, water, a water regional forum, maybe in Amman, uh, which both about management of water resources, but also secure, I mean, issues of climate security are examined in this specific one. A biodiversity forum in Jericho or Batir, I don't know, one of the two. And the fourth one, you know, we leave to for chance, but something in Iraq. <laughs> I'm speaking about the combinations. Thank you very much, uh, um, Shadad, Debbie, Tarek, and Gil. Before uh, we part ways, uh, just two remarks. One uh, is to say that uh, we have uh, many supporters for the Track to uh, Environmental Forum from around the world who help us tremendously diplomatically and otherwise. One of these supporters is Dennis Ross, who is probably the world's biggest expert on uh, Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. Um, which is not always a very fulfilling uh, career, but uh, you know, uh, that's life. Uh, he told us uh, at several uh, moments of our contacts that uh, he has only one regret uh, during about the work around the Oslo Accords and what came after that. And that is that they underestimated the role of civil society and of people to people projects. So that is a great encouragement to us because we see ourselves as uh, sort of emissaries to, uh, uh, to mend that wrong. And uh, although unfortunately for the moment, the track one, meaning the real subject matter, which is negotiations toward a two-state solution are not moving forward, uh, we feel that in our small field of influence, we have an obligation to move forward. The second remark is to say that regional cooperation, as I mentioned earlier, has become a real buzzword around the world and in Israel and in the region. The thing is that at least from an Israeli perspective, the more comfortable idea about regional cooperation concerns the Gulf, the Abraham Accords. Everybody loves them. I see our role, among others, and I know I'm not alone here, to remind everyone that it is wonderful to have great relations with the UAE and with Bahrain and with Morocco and hopefully in the near future with Saudi Arabia, but we cannot forget that where we live is our neighborhood, meaning Palestine and Jordan next to us and they have to remain a main focus of Israel's international relations and regional focus. We cannot just overlook them simply because there are some very rich people in the Gulf who want to buy lots of Israeli stuff. So that, I think, is really one of our goals, and it is on this note that I would like uh, to thank all the participants. I want a special thank to uh, Jesse and Evie and other people from the Arava Institute staff who made this possible. You did a great job. Thank you very, very much. I don't know if we have uh, people still watching us online, but if uh, you have survived so far, um, we congratulate you and we, we thank you for your attention. And uh, to all of you who came here tonight, uh, thank you, and we will see you next year. Thank you.